Okay then, hello, hello everyone. So now uh, it's already uh, 4 p.m. So uh, we shall uh, begin the last session of our conference uh, presented by uh, none other than our uh, speaker from yesterday, uh, Mr. Syed Mohammed Din, Head of Corporation Community and Public Engagement in Plus Malaysia. So he will be taking on the topic, the future of stakeholder and community engagement and beyond. So uh, without further ado, uh, Mr. Syed, Okay, we can just like uh, on, on your lead, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks, Chu. Uh, I hope everybody had your tea and some rest. I think you all had a very long session. So I'm standing between you now. Uh, and if you're working from office, your time to go home. And if you're working from home, your time to maybe spend time with your family or prepare dinner. So I'm going to keep this very casual and very short. You have heard multiple speakers from the past two days. So one of the key things that I would just like to share from my perspective of what is the future of stakeholder and community engagement going forward, especially when we're in the uh, community, I mean, in, under the pandemic conditions. Uh, Chu, could you move the next slide, please? So as we're going for that, you know, community engagement is about connecting with people who will make a difference to your life, whether it's your business, whether it's your career. These are stakeholders, right? And stakeholders have a level of skill in the game on whatever purpose you're doing, right? And as plus, we have multiple stakeholders because at the end of the day, even beyond the official stakeholders, what our offer does is we connect you and your loved ones together. That is the, the ultimate goal of PLUS. Next. So just to share with you, every stakeholder will have their own reason for existence as with us. And with that reason, we have charted what we call our mission, our vision and purpose. So maybe you all may or may not have visited our website, but our mission is very, very clear and it's not, it's not wavered for the past 33 years. It's to provide efficient and safe expressway network that enhances your quality of life. Our vision is to be a premier expressway group in the global arena. That has already been achieved when we won the Prince Michael International Road Safety Awards. And in fact, many, many uh, companies, uh, highway companies in Asia Pac has actually visited PLUS as an uh, official visit to find out how we do things the way we do. And we've become a benchmark of sorts for the toll highway industry around the region. Okay. So this is our new refreshed corporate values, ladies and gentlemen. It, it stems from our brand promise. So our corporate values to even to our own uh, staff is taking care of you. We make sure we, we, we take care of our staff uh, to do things better. That's what we all strive for. Uh, enterprise focus because there's so many different uh, channels and uh, platforms and departments that we work together in, we are focused in coming together on key projects to make it successful as a unit. And of course, taking pride in results is something that we uh, look forward to. Uh, we don't go out to purposefully win awards for the sake of winning, but the win winning awards is a byproduct of the efforts and uh, initiatives that we put in. And of course, committed to your growth, we're going on a digital transformation journey where we're upskilling and reskilling a lot of our people. And one of the key values that keeps us all together in terms of even our communications when we're engaging with the community is keeping our communications transparent and open. Next, please. So these are the guiding uh, lights and that has led us to all this, right? So a win for PLUS is a win for the community. So I'm sure, as I would just like to share with you, that we have won quite a number of global recognition as well as national recognition, right? And all these are true works that we've done. 
with our stakeholders as well as our community. So in terms of moving forward, when you have a stakeholder engagement, I think the stakeholders also want to know that the people or the person they're dealing with, or the organization they're dealing with, uh, at what level? Are they a recognized entity? It's just like when you are a stakeholder in a relationship, right? I'm sure you want to find out the background of your wife's family, where the parents work, what the brothers do, what the sisters are involved in, right? And when we have all these uh, accolades and awards, it gives credence and comfort to the stakeholders that we're dealing with, that we are at a high professional level and they have that assurance that they're uh, do, dealing with bona fide highway professionals, right? Next So one of the key things that we want to share is as we move in a new normal, we also are in line with what's going on with our stakeholders' life. So with the work from home, or they're supposed to be work from home and work from office. So everybody now is, my staff put their work from office twice. So I guess it's a signal that the staff are eager to come back to the office. But yes, we work together to break through the disruptions at work. I think if you all recall, it was very dark and gloomy days in the first call, the first instance that uh, MCO was called out. I think it wasn't even a blue ocean. It was purely a, a gray layer of unknown, right? I guess there was a lot of worries, a lot of anxiety, and it didn't help during that time, uh, Netflix came out with all this pandemic and all these zombie-related viruses movie during that period of the start of MCO. So it got a lot of people concerned, you know, of what the future and what tomorrow looks like. It's, it seems dark. And I still recall at night as I looked out my condo window the next day when the first day of MCO, not a single car was on the road. So it's really like going through those zombie movies. So just to reflect with you, we have acclimatized. So even in our discussion, uh, we do uh, uh, we do share this with our stakeholders on how we actually work from home or work from office. What are the best practices that we have come up with? So that's the value we add. So stakeholder and community engagement is if you want to make it more powerful you got to engage them and also share your experiences with them it's a two-way street it's not just taking from them as they may influence you but it's also giving them more and giving them sharing with them ideas of how to do things better okay next please So as we have, the other key thing is to keep the community safe through communications and through visual data. And from day one, safety is always our priority, right? And as the pandemic has not resided yet, contactless and cashless travel is still the mode that we will continue to push. And if the vaccination is successful, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure all of us will still follow the SOPs, will still wear the face mask on, and will still continue to have contactless and cashless uh, transaction wherever we may be. All right, next, please. So if you're going back and you come into the landscape where our stakeholders the business partners operate, you will see that the customer experience you gain now is under the new normal condition. Uh, it's a lot of uh, scheduled hygiene cleaning, uh, plus R&Rs, laybys, uh, OBRs. We've always kept safety and hygiene as our number one priority. Uh, is non-negotiable. With the new normal, we have, of course, included uh, strips for the physical distancing, uh, a higher level of um, cleaning in terms of public washroom, uh, sanitization, just to give 
our stakeholders the comfort when they visit any of our landed assets. Next. So, this was a question that was posed. Well, how do you anticipate challenges that your company and your community or stakeholders will face in the five to the next five to ten years? I think how do you anticipate anything at all in life is to actually be in close conversation, in close relationship, and to have a voracious appetite to seek knowledge, right? It is not just about on the digital front, but it's also on the human front to have that genuine thirst of knowledge to understand trends, to be very observant about things that are developing around you as an organization and what are sprouting out within your communities, what are the issues, what are the challenges, all these are either red flags or they are highlight points that you need to, as a community relations specialist, to be able to sniff out and pinpoint and map out that these are the future challenges that might pop up. And how do you prepare for that? It's just like preparing your crisis preparedness plans. You come up with a plan, you do scenario planning, you, you have simulations, and you find out where the market or how the landscape of stakeholdership engagement is going to go, right? And of course, naturally, the key point is building relationships via digital because I think everybody, even though I think you all heard of news that the government said uh, top management can return to the offices 100%, uh, and my MD today announced that he's going back to the office come Monday, the 5th of April, and working full hours, full eight hours. But he, that is his direction for himself. But he's also given us the comfort that we as the leaders in our function should decide with our team what is the best possible format, as long as it's based on trust and based on deliverables, right? So similarly, when you engage and you work with the stakeholders in the new normal, there needs to be a level of trust that how they're going to assist you and benefit you in the relationship and vice versa. All right. Next, please. So I think a lot of the speakers have touched on uh, sustainability, the ESG report. Uh, this was plus uh, very first uh, uh, sustainability report, which we launched in December. Um, the entire product is done in-house to the CCPE data visualization team. Uh, the copy was all done in-house. Um, it is uh, an internal document. But we are coming out with a ESG report uh, next month, and that's going to be printed, and that's going to be for our key government stakeholders as well as our business community, right? And that's going to be about a hundred and two, oh, 180 pages uh, coffee table book, right? Which we will hand out, and it actually shares the ESG initiatives and where we are plotted in terms of the sustainability development goals, uh, we cannot take everything because it's just not realistic. Um, and this data in this uh, report will be shared to the Prime Minister, will be shared to the Deputy Prime, uh, sorry, there's no Deputy Prime Minister at the moment, will be shared with the key ministers, right, that are relevant to us. So it will portray and give the right messages to these key stakeholders that we seek for them to support us in our future endeavors. Next, please. Can I have the next place too? So, straightforward question, what are the skills or traits that makes you a good stakeholder or community engagement person, right? I think first and foremost is the ability to really enjoy understanding communities. 
the ability to enjoy knowing what makes a person tick. Because at the end of the day, stakeholders are people. So if you have do not have a genuine interest in people, right? Whatever condition we're in, in a new normal, or if there's a stronger uh, pandemic situation, it's all about human interaction. So the key skill is human skills, right? Human skills of understanding, of finding out, curiosity to do research, and especially empathy of uh, having uh, to know what the person wants, uh, knowing where they're coming from, their background, the environment. This enables you to provide a bridge of understanding in how you narrate your messages. Okay? So in the Industry 5.0, as I said earlier, it's also humanizing the process. And here is how do you find the optimal balance of fostering the relationship with all the communities to become efficient and yet productive. Okay. Next, please. All right. Give me a few moments. My daughter just hit her head. Huh? Come here. Go and see teacher. Okay, come here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one of my stakeholders here has just injured her head. This is my four, five year old daughter, Ira. So, yes, being sensitive to your stakeholders' uh, environment or things that happen to them. Because as much as we need our stakeholders to help us and assist us, because they have an influence in our survivorhood, in our business continuity and sustainability. It is also important to know what do they need from us, what keeps them up awake at night. Right? So that level of genuineness of finding out, as we said in PLUS, we call it Ambit Paduli. Right? So while we had a were, we had a good budget for during MCO to help the medical fraternity, uh, especially we targeted the two big COVID hospitals, Hospital Kuala Lumpur and uh, Sungai Bulo. Uh, there was a location given to them. Uh, but we also got our Warga Plus, 3,800 of us, to help to support our fence line hospitals. Many of us at that time were just stuck staying at home, right? But how do you help in the previous format, in the old normal, so to speak? We could go out and do Goto Royongo and visit physically, talk to them and be with them, extend any physical help, and even financially, we can go and give it to them. But here, everything is disrupted. So how do we break through the disruption? We actually formulated uh Tabung Warga Plus and uh through corporate governance procedure it was set up um when with the approval of senior management we collected within less than two or three months 128,000 and we knocked on to we identified key hospitals ar along the NSE and knocked on their doors asking what sort of help do you need you know you are our stakeholder too because your functionality to flatten the COVID and to give service of uh, to, in terms of medical ailments to the community nearby. And this community are people who do work for us in our R&R &R, uh, and have families around that within the 30 kilometers radius. So how, how can we help? So we became very direct and very granular and then they came back and they responded. So we were able to help seven hospitals during that period. And um, uh, I believe that the benefit is multi multifold where the co living community around the surrounding areas will benefit from it. And at the next page, Chu. So one of the things that I love about PLUS is when we talk about community engagement, 
even the MD and the C-suites, we all turun ke Padang. We roll out our sleeves once we under, identify the community uh, that we are going through. Uh, by the way, disclaimer, all this happened before COVID. All right, if somebody is saying that, hey, why no mask, no physical distancing? So the disclaimer, this was in 2019. All right, so we actually identified with uh, Harian Metro, the Atitipan Kase program, and we went to, uh, you know, kampongs uh, who needed our help, and uh, we went there, and they also have a community of anak yatim, so we brought them out for, for raya shopping and all that, right? We had babuka puasa with them, and this is where the spirit of glue that strengthens uh, plus with our ground community is because they don't only see us in the papers, they also see us in real life, right? Um, and we have strong on-ground continuous activities and engagement through the Ambil Peduli uh, efforts that they are just like your neighbors who are always there and once in a while you tanya kaba. So the future is constant where this type of engagement is concerned. I think as human beings, you can never detach yourself and allow technology to replace you. You cannot. You will still need the human touch. Okay? The other part that you see below, while you think is what's all this uh, patrol cars, this is what I would term the strategic stakeholder collaboration that PLUS has done with strategic stakeholders like JPJ, the police, and even our PLUS Ronda who are auxiliary police to provide them through the collaboration equipment and tools to do the job better for us because they are able to enforce traffic rules and protect the highway uh, customers uh, with the powers that have been given to them by the government. So what we do is we look at them and we, we collaborate with them. So we have Ops Padu, Ops Slamat. Uh, and if you if you are traveling and then suddenly there's, there's a long queue, you know there's an Ops Slamat going on, uh, on on our highway, right? And all this is done with one goal in mind, to keep everyone who comes into our highway safer and have a more comfortable and uh, and a journey that's full of peace of mind for you and the family. Next, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, just re-emphasizing uh, the skills and trait that you need is to empathize and see from the eyes of your stakeholder. What are the challenges they face? What help they need? And when you reach out and engage, listen. Listen to, you know, you might empathize and you might have your own perception of what they need, but also let them tell you what they truly need and listen. And always have that open communication where they also don't aga aga or they're not a bit worried or shy to share with you. So the open and honest communication platform allows stronger relationships to be built, right? As in any marriage, trust is number one. In any relationship, trust is number one. And in any community and stakeholder engagement, trust is also number one. All right, next please. So, the role of online engagement tools and platform. Yes, we have all our gadgets. And in fact, our Plus Ronda has also embraced digital technology. Uh, in, in the previous time when there was a highway customer who was stranded, who was involved in a traffic incident, uh, the process, just imagine two patrol unit officers from the Plus Ronda coming down to help, needing to set up a safe zone so that protects you where you are hurt or injured or your car is stuck from other vehicles coming. But at the same time, they need to look at you to ensure and take down the details and understand what had happened. 
and that was all manual in pen and paper. Now they carry iPads and they key it in. Data gets transferred straight to the TMC. TMC calibrates the information. Uh, the, the 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 police patrol car. The the uh, if there is requirement for the fire engine, uh, the, of course, naturally the pet medical ambulances. They will all get more real time data, and they will know how to prepare when they get into the site to help that highway customer. So yes, while we know progress is unavoidable, we also need to make sure that we have that balance when we use uh, digital tools and we use online engagement to not forget that human, the humanness in our interaction that we're going to portray. Okay, next please. So one of the big plus digital transformation journey is that our traffic monitoring center in the past was the standard uh, video that actually just captures the visual of the cars going in and then, you know, it records time. But the traffic mon monitoring center, the first thing we've done is we've upgraded the screen to become LED screens We've upgraded the cameras to be able to zoom in, where now if you, for example, if you're on Penang Bridge, we have the cameras. Dulu is static and it's one way and, and we see what we see. But now with this uh, new CCTV camera, we can zoom in, get the plate number very clearly and get to see how the, the front passengers, who they are and all that. So eventually there's going to be video analytics that will be embedded into this technology where this will in, in, uh, per, enable us to enforce, uh, work with the enforcement agency should there be an incident uh, to identify number plate identification. So it's going to be big data analytics that's coming to play, right? And this, how does it help uh, uh, stakeholders? It helps our stakeholders to support us in a more salient manner, but it also helps the community around the area where we have all this monitoring to feel more comforted and safer. And I think you all have heard about the contactless payment solution. The, you have actually started with the electronic toll collection, which is through this uh, touch and go card. And then of course you have that uh, conduit called the smart tech device, but it's actually the touch and go card that's doing the payment transaction. And now we're coming out with the RFID, where it's going to be a seamless transaction. Uh, you don't need to stop. You just go through, you download the app from the touch and go into your, into your phone. You have an e-wallet there. Uh, you can connect it uh, to your, your own uh, online account or your credit card and you will never be stuck for needing cash at the at the toll lanes right so this what it does is it also uh, supports congestion less uh, situations at the toll right now people who still want to top up with cash they create a congestion at the toll lanes and you know all this carbon uh to carbon footprint expands and it is not healthy and good for the community, surrounding community, right? The other part of the digital transformation journey we've just launched uh, last year, PUTRI stands for Plus Unique Texting Real-Time Interface. Uh, she takes off 75% of the load of the people in the TMC, the Traffic Monitoring Center. She takes the questions of uh, the standard questions in terms of your toll fare, your traffic information, uh, what is your plasma points, what are the products and facilities that are offered, what are the promotions of the R&R, &R? is Baskin Robin giving you a, a free ice cream if you buy a tub, etc, etc, etc. So that frees our traffic monitoring center to actually take calls with people who are really in, in a situation and they need help and comfort. Alright? Because we know Technically, 80% of the calls come in are actually really standard, not your everyday emergency calls, right? Okay. Ah, you can share with us your consultant managing the interactive electronic toll, interactive smart toll. Okay. So all this 
uh, apa touch and go e wallet all that is under touch and go they are a subsidiary of CIMB they are a partner we do not own them they are a separate entity they are business partner for our business solution so i hope that answers hayati punya answer so if you want to get in touch with touch and go yes i can give you the contact of my my uh, head of comms peer there or, or the marketing person okay uh, the other question from augustine i will answer once i, I i'm done with it okay augustine <clears throat> next slide please yeah i can put your questions up here so so okay i've just shared with you putri who she is the next step for putri is we're going to train her to be dwee basa there eventually will come a animated voice putri okay uh we do get weird people asking her for dates just to let you know huh? so that's <laughs> something all right next please oh that's it so this is uh the bukit lanjan on the night time when we're going home so that's my email contact if you have any questions after this, I'm always open. I think we would like to share one video before I part. And this video is about PLUS today. The video I shared yesterday was about uh, when PLUS was uh, uh, started, the beginning of PLUS. Are you able to put the play the video from my slide, uh, Chiu? Uh, I'm playing the view to the VLT, but I'm sharing right now, okay? Okay, okay. Can anyone see the black screen? Uh, not yet. Okay. Still nothing yet. Yeah, I, I see it. But from yesterday and today, how come we have these grey boxes around? Man? Okay, one more word. Did optimizing video motion share vlc okay boleh ke okay but we still have the gray boxes okay Chu, the gray box is actually what you can see on your screen you minimize that and put it on top To minimize that, you can see the left.
Okay, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Forward Plus, which uh, this video was actually done in conjunction with our 2020 announcement where we further reduce our tow rates by 18%. Okay, so I think from the video, from the interaction, from the certain optics of uh, visuals that we shared, I think you'll be able to also have an idea the type of stakeholders that we have to engage in, right? I think you can know from the Ketua Kampong in the in the area uh, to the section punya business community uh, to the the government ministries punya state uh, office. Uh, or local officers, JKR and all that. Um, it's multiform. And, and as I shared yesterday, our universe at the moment is at 584. And that's just government. That doesn't include the non-government stakeholders that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? I think you also notice one of the elements of the safety vehicle. So if you do travel on plus and then suddenly you say, hey, how come ah, congestion? Ah, why are everybody traveling slow? Uh, because the safety vehicles is up front with the uh, the red color vehicle that, where the, peop the person has to man manually come out physically to take the debris off the highway so that highway customers can continue their journey safely. All right, so... There needs to be a lot of patience when, when that happens. All right. Um, on, on that note, uh, we are then open for questions. But I would like to answer Augustine's question. Augustine, can I, can I see you, Augustine? Can you open your camera? Okay. You're from uh, Sarawak. I'm from uh, uh, based in uh, Sarawak, Kuching. Lah, huh? uh, sorry, which organization? Tadi they cut sikit. Sarawak Energy. Ah, Sarawak Energy. Okay, okay. Yes. So I think your, 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 your question is the same challenges that I think my HSR would also be facing. Right? Mm -hmm. I think PLUS would have faced it 30 years ago. Right? I think... Uh, there is no silver bullet uh, on how you deal this. But I think when you talk about the upper community engagement to the people in the interiors, firstly, I, one of the key things that all of us should do is actually be respectful and cognizant of how the lifestyle was before we came, inverted commas, and enroached into their lives. Correct? And I think one of the good things I would say, suggest is prior to this, the, the ideal way is to have a... It's like kawin, you know, you merisik. Uh, you merisik, you send a team there. Find out what is their surrounding life, how it's been for the past 
five years or ten years. What is the community like? Are they predominantly left with the old people? Or are they still having a good mix of the young and the middle age? Or, you know, they are more of the 30, 40 years old because, you know, lifespan expectancy. So that humanistic configuration gives you a, a sort of a jigsaw look into the entire ecosystem that they've been living in, right? And I think to ask them the questions about what keeps them awake at night, what they're happy with, with their environment, with their life over there. I think these are little, little conscientious notes that will help you to build the profile of that surrounding environment and of the community. And, and, and what is that, that uh, per takeaway that the community would expect if somebody comes in? So it's like, as I said, when you go and marisik somebody you want to marry, you want to find out what are the right hot buttons to push for the yes. Right. So similarly with this, you need to find out who is the power influencer within the community. Some people might say it's the Ketua Kampung. But for all you know, it could be the Ketua Kampung's wife. Hey, you know what I mean or not? So how, you, you need to take time and identify that. Sometimes you say, oh, but we don't have time. I think you need to do make time and get uh, people who are proficient in terms of skills in engaging uh, uh, human community, right? So one of the key things is because you, you when you say you're going to take something away from them because you need to build something on top of them, anyone, even for me, you know, if, if now where I'm staying in the condo, uh, there is a new developer who took over the development and they want to rehash certain things and uh, reduce the number of car parks, for instance, right? To, to, to give a better flow. So So they will always have the cost-benefit analysis done on the corporate side. But me, as, as the end user or as the, the resident, I've been living here for God knows how many years. I'm very happy with the way things are. And you're going to disrupt it. So you need to find that uh, equilibrium of what is the item or value that I'm willing to forego or trade for that discomfort that you're going to cost me, right? Yes, generally we say monetary. And I'll tell you monetary-wise, more often than not, everyone will say, tak cukup bah. <laughs> Money not enough, right? There are certain things in terms of family value, uh, heritage that is important to them. So I think a lot of corporations, when they go in into a community, they only look at the cost benefit and equation with the monetary, right? Sometimes they might want a certain piece of a portion of the land that is out of, uh, that doesn't disrupt your development, right? That gives them that comfort that, okay, I, I'm happy with this. Sometimes they're very happy with things that are non-monetary. So that's why it's very, very important that we go down. And as I said from the first day, we engage them as fellow human beings. We see them as equals. Very much when a developer or a big entity that steps into the kampong, into the villages, we always come in with a colonial mindset that I am mightier than thou. And that's the biggest no-no that we should go in. We should go in there respecting the landowner, the the people of the land who has been there for for centuries or for a long time. Give them the due respect and say, look, we need to do this. Why? Explain to them the impact benefit that's going to be infused into the community. I think like plus places like Gunung Sbangol, Pago, they were underdeveloped or they were just bypassed before PLUS existed. PLUS had to cut through the hinterlands. But at the end of the day, what was their benefit in the long run all these decades? Uh, economic activities. And they become enriched through that. So they need to be given the scenario of what is the greater benefit at the end of the day where they relinquish or forgo their heritage land or you know whatever in terms of their livelihood that they've 
being accustomed to. So it takes a lot of uh, managing difficult conversations, I would say. But I think if you go out with an open heart that, you know, if you believe this is really going to benefit the people uh, there in the, in the long run, and what sort of interim comfort can you afford or accord them without breaking the bank, of course, but also that they will be comfortable with and that will be satisfied with? I think those are the type of conversation middle ground that we all should look at. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope that. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yes. Because uh, our experience in uh, Sarawak through Sarawak Energy, we are a, a hydro project developer. Mm. We have uh, several hydro projects, some already commissioned, like Bakun Hydro, Murum Hydro, Batang Air Hydro projects. And also, the another one is the Bale hydro project, which is in the implementation stage now. Huh? So, our engagement, our purpose, purpose, purpose <laughs> our context here is uh, different from, I think, from other projects, how you handle the communities, because, mm. uh, because we are handling with longhouse yeah. community mm. who are used to live in the upper river of the Rajang River, Correct. Barak yeah. River, and Bale Rivers. So this, we have to move them, we have to resettle them when they are uh, already uh, being uh, surveyed to be yeah. submerged, submerged by, the pro by the project, uh, by the reservoir. So mm. this is very complex based on our social environment impact assessment studies also. Uh, reveals that there are so many uh, uh, environment or cultural whatever livelihood of these uh, project affected people going to be affected and mm -hmm. the, the the challenges we have with hydro projects development in every stages of every stage of the project life cycle initial stage preparation stage construction and operations so our context of our engagement strategy here is very much different from uh, ordinary projects. So Correct, because you're relocating them, you're uprooting them from yes. their homes, technically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, 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 that, so, so I think that's, that's where, Augustine, we need to, in a human to human, because people are never comforted by the fact they need, they are going to be changed, right? People yes. don't like change. But if you can show them that is something of a better future, if there is a possibility of... I'm sure when you relocate them, you would have given them a location that is more amenable. And of course, I think number one priority is always safety, correct? Because of your, your, your progress of your development. Uh, uh, yes. So I think that the key engager here would be who is the power influencer within that longhouse community, right? If you can get those, uh, the senior people, the elders who are able to influence and they understand the value and tell them it's, it's for the future, for your, not only your children, but the grandchildren and, and henceforth. And if there's element of um, employment given, to them to, to support the project. That means then they have skin in the game that this project is not just uh, uprooting or, or, or relocating them, you know, or not pulling them away, but it's actually they're going to be part of it to build something sustainable for the future. That's one. The other thing is, I'm sure in terms of the, they're going to have electricity and better water, better utilities, uh, benefits. And then maybe on the other level is, what about their children? You know, uh, if, if uh, uh, Sarawak Energy is going to say, okay, you know, uh, there's special concession for scholarships for your children, right? So that you put them to the University Sarawak or wherever, they can, they can take up uh, the, the studies and eventually also have the accept, the, they have the first right of refusal if there's uh, job opportunities within yours. So technically, you're, you're bringing them into your bosom, so to speak. 
and say we're not pushing you away so that we can build this uh, uh, upper development. We're actually including you because you are going to be part of the future sustenance of this, not only this development, but it's for the country and for the people. So that's my thought, you know. Yeah, basically, because uh, on top of the project benefits uh, directly from the project budget, CSR comes uh, very important. Corporate social responsibility, which I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm one of the uh, leaders here in Sao Energy. So that's why CSR is not only during the project life cycle only, but it's uh, ongoing to look after the communities that are being uh, displaced or resettled. Over many years, we have to come up with many uh, pillars or focus area of uh, social investment in education, environment, culture, cultural heritage, and this mm. uh, community development and uh, skill training, uh, part of this very important uh, focus area for the people. Yeah, and, and, and I, I would say some might, some people who are handling stakeholder engagement might say they don't envy you, but I do envy you because you got a very rich experience because I know the East Malaysian, there are so many layers, even within a, a certain tribe, there are different denominations and the different little nuances of the punya culture, trait, the punya idiosyncrasy, likes yes. and dislikes. So it's very complex, right? But I, yes. I, I think... Um, Anybody who gets to 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 collaborate with you and learn the experience is going to be very enriching indeed. Yes, because uh, the community is affected by even one project could be from different, different uh, like from Iban communities, Orang Ulu communities, several communities. So mm -hmm. they, they have different customs yeah. and traditions we have to handle, and then uh, another project have different uh, communities again. So. <laughs> Is uh, we have to really uh, be part of them. Uh, yeah. we, we must know. We must. That's why we work together. We go through uh, the community leaders, the longhouse leaders, the community consultative committees. Yeah. Uh, very important. Where every project must have a consultative committees to represent the communities. Uh. Uh, this we are the main main stakeholder, uh, stakeholders that we. We are collaborating with partnership with throughout our our this one projects development. Mm. That, can I ask you? Spend, yeah. yeah. No, can I ask you when 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 you're doing that engagement, do you like uh, uh select a team member to to maybe spend some time with them, stay overnight in their long house, so to so to speak to 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 get into the uh, you know the way of life that they're doing to to understand them better you know uh, that might give some different perspective of how uh, might strengthen in terms of what language or what words that we use that they may be more acceptable or palatable to uh, what actually we do here is uh... For one particular project in that uh, area, we will uh, recruit some uh, a group of licensed office, uh, officers uh, who are from the affected directly affected communities to be part of our uh, licensed officers because we are also community relations officer. We are also social investment uh, officers in the in the different groups division of CSR. Mm. So we. We engage these liaison officers who are very local, hmm. who knows these. These are our front liners, line, right? So right. We, we from HQ in from the CSR, we 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 team up together to to engage the community. It, big dialogues or specific dialogues. We also team up with the district officers, district office, the resident office, and the, a few. Strong energy plus five, uh, so we are about six group moving together, and uh, of course the liaison officer will move in first to to do the recce, the recce and all, all this uh, mm -hmm. to what is on the going to be conducted on the ground. Right. We call so, it the uh, rumah rumah asap session, 
Oh, rumah asap ah. Like, 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 rumah asap session. That, that. Like, like, <laughs> like, 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 like here we call it teh tarik session. Yeah, lah. yeah, okay. Ah, session. Okay. So, yes. so, so, Augustine, I just want to find out. I, I know you posed the challenge. What uh, question to me about the engagement experience? Unfortunately, I've joined plus two years, so I've not had any uh, per challenging engagement experience yet. You know, but I like to ask you back. Have, have you and Morris have that? Maybe you could share with us. What was the yes. first challenge? Yeah. yeah, since uh, I'm coming to nine years with Sound Energy, I've been involved in many hydro projects and uh, uh, many engagement, big sessions uh, with the communities. The most fragile and the uh, uh, engagement challenging one, uh, most is during the initial stage when you want to introduce the project to the to the communities. You will face a lot of uh, uh, opposition uh. Mm. when you are gathering around few hundreds of the community at the longhouse veranda. Yeah, <laughs> these people are not uh, same wavelength with you. You know, they are just longhouse people. They speak anything that they can. Uh, they want to, to 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 say to you. Some will will just bang the the wall. They just shout at you. Because they, they are very emotional, you know. Uh, mm. the idea that you are going to move them from the NCR, from the ancestors' land, from the river bank that they used to fish and travel by longboats. Now you are flooding everything, the land, their longhouse, and move them somewhere in an unknown uh, area, which is not, which is could be a. Uh, congested, resetted between 15 communities, 50 longhouse to at one place. So they mm. might, there is a fear there for the, on, on, of the future. So mm, yeah. once that is over, once they accepted the, the idea, the project and uh, the benefit that they will, the resettlement, resettlement action plan that they will uh, receive, then uh, during the operation, during the element construction, you will bound to face some more uh, issues. This will be on the compensation. Where is my money? Mm. The project is almost completed. Why you have not paid me my I, my million dollar compensation? I want to go overseas with the money. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So so technically technically the. I think like for, for, for anyone is the, the, the initial knowledge that they're going to be uprooted uh, will cause anxiety and anger, right? Because yes. you're pulling them away from familiar grounds, right? And then I think once they realize that the, the progress is going to happen regardless, right? Then I think the, the, the reality sinks in that, okay, I, I will take it. But the other anchor for them is the compensation, so as you said correctly, uh, lah, the next stage of mana my duit lah, you know. So, yes. so I think though, I think if you look at it, whether uh, it is in Sabah, Sarawak, or even Semenanjung, I think when it comes to dealing with indigenous people who have been entrenched and ingrained in certain location, and that you want to break through that hinterland, I think these are the normal psychological reaction and the normal emotional process flow that goes to it and i believe that the human intervention the the showing of genuine care the awareness and education of of the benefits in the long run and of course i think when it comes to the payment that one it depends on their character right even though you you promise them certain things sometimes they want it faster sometimes they suddenly ask for more uh, those are i would say that goes back to Every human lah, yes. not, not not only them lah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. One of the culture issues is uh, uh, one of the issues is uh, they are the fear that their culture will submerge with the, in the in the reservoir. But it's actually it's not that uh, it's not that going to happen. Mm. So that's why in our CSR pillars we also emphasize on to preserve and uh, the talent and the skill of their culture, uh, their tradition, their dance, their dancers, their, their music, even the heritage that uh, affected the ecotourism. 
to be affected. That's why South Tourism, like Mr. Maurice here, my friend here, is also <laughs> playing a playing a very important role in in to to sustain this uh, uh, culture culture uh, and heritage. All this, uh, all those yeah. landscape that that can be still can be used as tourism spots. Yeah, and and I think Sarawak Tourism is doing a great job because I think the that that culture for for Sarawak is an asset, you know. So while while you are creating a, a new asset called uh, the upper, uh, the dam, yeah, the these human assets, I would call it these cultural human assets, are something that organizations in Rawa should actually consider how do we leverage and, and and bring up and elevate this you know so perhaps it might not be only the the job of Rawa energy but you could look at other collaborative organizations to 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 come in to play you know and I'm sure like Rawa energy would also be dealing with the pan Borneo Bunya developers because they need electricity along that highway you know, is there anywhere, any opportunity or any platform within that relationship where those people who are uh, resettled, whether they can be given opportunities to, to thrive and, and to flourish? I think that's one thing. If a, if a community knows that with your upper invasion, the use of a better word, but it will give them the, the opportunity to flourish and thrive, I think when they weigh that in, it's going to be a, a plus plus point for them. You know, I think everybody, all of us at the end of the day, negotiation is about how do we get that win 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 uh, equation, and I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Really over, let's say, like Bakun, they have been resetted for about almost thirty years now. They are they realize that they are better off than uh, if they chose to stay in the rural without transportation, without a lot of the public uh, utility amenities, all this. That's why, but for new projects, uh, we have uh, difficulty to approach them. And uh, there's one uh, project that we uh, under moratorium, like the Baram project, because of uh, community opposition. So now we are moving to Indonesia in Kalimantan to, to develop few hydro projects there for the for Indonesian government. Lah. Right, right, right. So so that initial it's called what? Balang, is it the hydro dam? The the one Bar that is a lot they, they have Baram a lot of, oh, Baram, huh? So is there a Baram lot of dam. why why was their how why were they adverse? Is it something to do deeper than it's, than yeah, than it's the uh, environmentalist groups like Safe Rivers. They they really protest against uh, flooding the, this uh these rivers. Lah. They want to maintain the natural river landscape, the the old lifestyle. This this group they said we don't need to flood Baram to submerge Baram again because we have enough uh, electricity from other projects that is there. <laughs> that is I there. See. So, but, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I think the other thing in terms of uh, convincing is data. I think if you have uh, data that you can back up, that data is taken from information that uh, enables uh, the audience or the stakeholder to to be educated and be aware then i think that would be very useful in terms of decision making right so i think the 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 environmentalists most probably they have used some data against uh you know to, to yes to project they, they are they collaborate with foreign ngos like bruno Mensers. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Very well. They, they are very, very strong, actually. Mm. A, lot, a lot of uh, political people in. But but there is a cost benefit done, right? If if that if that hydro upper uh, yeah. doesn't they, come, what was the what what is the downside of it? You know. Mm. Now the. 
that area is already because the the alternative we the, the alternative project is the ballet project which is under construction now so we okay we about that yeah so so that that baram people are are, are going behind <laughs> in terms oh. of road, uh, roads in terms of uh, I new way of I yes. see, I see. Infrastructures or this thing. Yeah, but but I, but I, 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 time. I yeah. So I, I would say that you know while while don't be like a politician, the politician will only come and fix the road when it's near general elections. Even though you were pushed away, I would say still keep a little connection there with them, right? While they had the support of the environmentalists and the Bruno Master NGO too. Don't worry, it's okay. Show them fine, you know, you 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 didn't want this, okay. We 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 hear you. We're doing other things, but we still want to touch base because we are part of you. We are orang Sarawak juga, you know, at the end of the day. And as you said, this may even speed up the relationship that one day there might be an opportunity when your people connect and then show them the the benefits that you have given to to other projects for for all the other people who have been relocated, then it might come to their senses and say, hey, yeah, you know, why not? You know, maybe can you guys come back and reconsider and and, and build your dam? You know, it's possible, right? Yeah, because one of the position statement last time is build roads for us first before you build the dams. So now uh, our Pen Bonio road is going in. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know whether they still remember what they say. We build a through Pen Bonio now. Uh, I think in the future, maybe the younger generation will accept the hydro projects because oh, sure. own, yeah. Yeah. now uh, uh, yeah, the the fear is very high. Uh, when educated people in ten or twenty years time, they might change. Said we must have this high project coming into yeah. us. Yeah. True. 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 So you don't be like, yeah. Uh, you better prepare so you don't become like Slango. Always got water problem. Hey, Ayah Slango is here. Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay. You you are there, Ayah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So we we'll take up Thank more you. time. Uh, and any other question? I think I I've crossed the the time limit. I think everybody also want to yeah to go. Any, Because any... I I ah. yeah. I missed this a few sessions this afternoon because I was away having a meeting. So that's why now ah, it's okay. Good, good yeah, time. no, 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 no. Same. Even <laughs> even even my first half this morning, I was in the uh, our our CMT meeting. You know, and we had back to backs. Okay. Okay. So Thank so you. Chu. Ah, uh, thanks, thanks, Augustine. Thanks, Morris. Ah. Uh, Chu, I hand it back to you, Chu. Yes. Okay then. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Said. Uh, uh for for all of this, <laughs> actually. So, um, and thank you for the participant to actually participate in this Q and A. Actually, uh, it's been uh, very nice knowing. Uh, we know a bit more on the uh, Sarawak side, lah. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll, I would like to say thank you, everyone, for attending.